Hello and welcome back to the novel study of the Phantom Tollbooth. Today is chapter 7, which is called The Royal Banquet. So let's get this out of the way right off the bat. A banquet is an elaborate and formal evening meal for many people, often followed by speeches. And that should give you a clue as to what's going to happen here. We know that in the last chapter, Milo uh, met up again with the uh, five advisors of King Xaz, and they said that the royal banquet's about to start. So they put him in a wagon, a wagon that, if you remember, it only goes without saying. That was an idiom we learned. And now we're going to head to King Xaz's royal palace and check out this banquet. There are a lot of idioms and puns in this chapter. So we're going to take it one section at a time and review all the different idioms and puns that are going to be on your quiz. So stay tuned. As we begin the chapter, I'd like you to really use your imagination to visualize the details that are described about the palace. Okay, let's begin. Chapter 7, The Royal Banquet. Right this way, follow us. Come along, step lively. Here we go, they shouted, hopping from the wagon and bounding up the broad marble stairway. Milo and Tok followed close behind. It was a strange looking palace, and if he didn't know any better, he would have said that it looked exactly like an enormous book standing on end with its front door in the lower part of the binding, just where they usually place the publisher's name. Okay, this one's easy to visualize because I have a book in front of me. So imagine the palace is like a giant book standing like this, probably thicker, and the door to the palace is right where they usually put the publisher's name, and there is a publisher symbol down here, but that's the door to the palace. Now, let's visualize what the inside looks like. Once inside, they hurried down a long hallway, which glittered with crystal chandeliers and echoed with their footsteps. The walls and ceiling were covered with mirrors, whose reflections danced dizzily along with them, and the footmen bowed coldly. So footmen are like guards in the palace, and they bow as Milo and the others walk by, but what I love is the visualization of the uh, ceiling and the walls are covered with mirrors. Imagine how cool that must look to walk down a long hallway that is all mirrors reflecting you and everything else. We must be terribly late, gasped the Earl nervously as they reached the tall doors of the banquet hall. It was a vast room. Vast. Full of people loudly talking and arguing. The long table was carefully set with gold plates and linen napkins. Linen is, of course, cloth woven from flax. An attendant stood behind each chair, and at the center, raised slightly above the others, was a throne covered in crimson cloth. Crimson, one of my favorite colors. Crimson is a deep, rich red color, which is kind of close to purple. Directly behind on the wall was the royal coat of arms, flanked by the flags of Dictionopolis. Okay, it is not a coat that has arms growing out of it. A coat of arms is a real thing, and you can see that a coat of arms is a unique design painted on a shield. These designs may be inherited, meaning that they pass from a father to his children. In the Middle Ages, these designs were shown on real shields, but today they are usually only drawn or painted on the paper. Coats of arms are normally issued for real people, but nowadays lots of countries and businesses also have coats of arms. Each symbol on the coat of arms will represent something that has an important meaning to that person, family, country, or company. So if you look at the picture, you can see the coat of arms for Dictionopolis, 
and in the middle there are the five vowels E, A, O, I, and U. You look like, uh, looks like there are some angels, baby angels, babies with wings. Those are actually known as cherubs. And it seems that they have a D in their mouth, mouths for Dictionopolis. And there's a crown at the top. So a coat of arms is going to have symbols that represent the person, the family, or the company. And when it says flanked by the flags of Dictionopolis, flanked means on either side of. So there's the coat of arms and the flags are flanking the coat of arms. Milo noticed many of the people he had seen in the marketplace. The letterman was busy explaining to an interested group the history of the W. And off in a corner, the humbug and the spelling bee were arguing fiercely about nothing at all. Officer Shrift wandered through the crowd, suspiciously, there's that vocabulary word again, muttering, guilty, guilty, they're all guilty. And on noticing Milo, brightened visibly and commented in passing, is it six million years already? My, how time flies. Now, time flies is, of course, an idiom you've probably heard before. It just means when you say that time flies, it means time seems to pass very quickly. Everyone seemed quite grumpy about having to wait for lunch, and they were all relieved to see the tardy guests arrive. Certainly glad you finally made it, old man, said the humbug, cordially pumping Milo's hand. As guest of honor, you must choose the menu, of course. Oh my, he thought, not knowing what to say. Be quick about it, suggested the spelling bee. I'm famished, F-A-M-I-S-H-E-D. One of your vocabulary words. As Milo tried to think, there was an ear-shattering blast of trumpets entirely off key, and a page, which is an assistant, announced to the startled guests, King Ozaz, the unabridged. Okay, if we're going to meet the king, we better know exactly what his name means real quick. So he's Azaz, the unabridged. So unabridged is when something is not cut out or shortened. It's complete. Everything is left in. If something is abridged, it means that things were taken out. It was cut short. So if you think of dictionaries, right? Dictionaries used to be published in paper books before the internet, and you could not always fit every single word in a dictionary if it was in book form, so most dictionaries' books were abridged. Some words, a lot of words, were left out. But this is King Azaz, the unabridged. And so you can probably make an inference that if he is the king of Dictionopolis, and unabridged means nothing is left out, and Dictionopolis has to do with words, then he must know all the words. Let's continue. He was the largest man Milo had ever seen, with a great stomach, large, piercing eyes, a gray beard that reached to his waist, and a silver signet ring on the little finger of his left hand. He also wore a small crown and a robe with the letters of the alphabet beautifully embroidered all over it. What have we here? He said, staring down at Tok and Milo as everyone else took his place. If you please, said Milo, my name is Milo, and this is Tak. Thank you very much for inviting us to your banquet, and I think your palace is beautiful. Exquisite, corrected the duke. Lovely, counseled the minister. Handsome, recommended the count. Pretty, hinted the earl. Charming, submitted the undersecretary. Silence, suggested the king. Now, young man, what can you do to entertain us? Sing songs, tell stories, compose sonnets, juggle plates, do tumbling tricks? What is it? I can't do any of those things, 
admitted Milo. What an ordinary little boy, commented the king. Why, my cabinet members can do all sorts of things. The duke here can make mountains out of molehills. The minister splits hairs. The count makes hay while the sun shines. The earl leaves no stone unturned. And the undersecretary, he finished ominously, hangs by a thread. Can't you do anything at all? First of all, ominously is one of your vocabulary words that we talked about previously. Shows up a lot. And secondly, we need to go back into that paragraph because it is filled with five brand new idioms. And let's take them one by one so we know what they mean for the quiz. To make a mountain out of a molehill means to make a small problem into a bigger one. You know, think about it. A molehill is that small, but a mountain is that big. So if your problem is really only as big as a molehill, you don't want to make it bigger like the size of a mountain. And then the minister splits hairs. So what does it mean to split hairs? It means to make unnecessary distinctions between things when the differences between them are so small they are not important. It's when you argue over something that really doesn't even matter. Splitting hairs. And the count makes hay while the sun shines. Well, making hay while the sun shines means to make good use of an opportunity while it lasts. And then we have the Earl who leaves no stone unturned. Well, leaving no stone unturned means to try every possible course of action in order to achieve something. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to make this happen. I'm going to leave no stone unturned. And finally, the undersecretary hangs by a thread. This one you might have heard before if you were ever in trouble with your parents or your teacher and you had like one last chance and they say you're hanging by a thread. It means to be in a risky or unstable situation. And if you think about that, if you are hanging by one thread, that thread could break at any minute and you could fall. And so that's why it means to be in a risky or unstable situation. So the joke here is that King Azaz is saying, my advisors can do lots of things, and he uses all of these idioms which are figurative, and he makes it as if each of the ministers literally does those things. Makes mountains out of molehills, splits hairs, makes hay while the sun shines, leaves no stone unturned, and hangs by a thread. Can't you do anything at all? I can count to a thousand, offered Milo. Ah, numbers. Never mention numbers here. Only use them when we absolutely have to, growled Azaz disgustedly. Now, why don't you and Tok come up here and sit next to me, and we'll have some dinner? Are you ready with the menu? reminded the humbug. Well, said Milo, remembering that his mother always told him to eat lightly when he was a guest. Why don't we have a light meal? A light meal it shall be, roared the bug, waving his arms. The waiters rushed in carrying large serving platters and set them on the table in front of the king. When he lifted the covers, shafts of brilliant colored light leaped from the plates and bounced around the ceiling, the walls, across the floor, and out the windows. So here we have a pun. A pun is, of course, a joke using the different possible meanings of a word. So in this case, the pun is a light meal, and we know that it means to eat a small portion of food or something that is not very heavy on the stomach, but in this case, literally in the book, light comes off of the plates. Let's continue. Not a very substantial meal, said the humbug, rubbing his eyes, but quite an effective one. Perhaps you can suggest something a little more filling. The king clapped his hands. The platters were removed, and without thinking, Milo quickly suggested, well, in that case, I think we ought to have a square meal of, 
A square meal it is, shouted the humbug again. The king clapped his hands once more, and the waiters reappeared, carrying plates heaped high with steaming squares of all sizes and colors. And there, of course, is your second pun. A square meal figuratively just means a filling, satisfying, and balanced meal. But the literal joke in the book is that they actually bring out squares of food. Ugh said the spelling bee, tasting one. These are awful. No one else seemed to like them very much either, and the humbug got one caught in his throat and almost choked. Time for the speeches, announced the king as the plates were again removed and everyone looked glum. You first, he commanded, pointing to Milo. Uh, Your Majesty, ladies and gentlemen, started Milo timidly, which means shyly. I would like to take this opportunity to say that in all the... That's quite enough, snapped the king. Mustn't talk all day. But I'd just begun, objected Milo. Next, bellowed the king. Roast turkey, mashed potatoes, vanilla ice cream recited the humbug, bouncing up and down quickly. What a strange speech, thought Milo, for he'd heard many in the past and knew that they were supposed to be long and dull. Hamburgers, corn on the cob, chocolate pudding, P-U-D-D-I-N-G, said the spelling bee in his turn. Frankfurters, sour pickles, strawberry jam, shouted Officer Shrift from his chair. Since he was taller, sitting than standing, he didn't bother to get up. And so down the line it went, with each guest rising briefly, making a short speech, and then resuming his place. When everyone had finished, the king rose. Now, I am no good at French, and everything that the king is about to order is a French meal. So please, to all the French people out there, forgive me. Pâté de foie gras, soup à l'oignon, façon sous cloche, salade endive, fromages et fruits et demitas, he said carefully and clapped his hands again. Again, I am very sorry to the French for butchering your language. The waiters reappeared immediately carrying heavy, hot trays, which they set on the table. Each one contained the exact words spoken by the various guests, and they all began eating immediately with great gusto. Dig in, said the king, poking Milo with his elbow and looking disapprovingly at his plate. Psst, I can't say that I think much of your choice. I didn't know that I was going to have to eat my words, objected Milo. Of course, of course, everyone here does, the king grunted. You should have made a tastier speech. Now, eat your words is, of course, an idiom. And when we say it figuratively, we mean to admit that something you said before was wrong. You know, if you said, oh, it's going to rain today. And I said to you, oh, it's not, you're gonna eat your words. And then later on, it didn't rain. You had to admit to me that you were wrong. You ate your words. But in the book, whatever you say, you literally eat your words that you say. And Milo did not realize this. So his speech was kind of boring and his words therefore are unappetizing, even though he has to eat those words. Milo looked around at everyone, busily stuffing himself, and then back at his own unappetizing plate. It certainly didn't look worth eating, and he was so very hungry. Okay, now pay attention closely because we have some more puns and some new idioms coming up. I'll review them after the end of this page. Here, try some somersault, suggested the Duke. It improves the flavor. Have a rigmarole, offered the Count, passing the bread basket. 
or a ragamuffin, seconded the minister. Perhaps you'd care for a synonym bun, suggested the duke. Why not wait for your just desserts, mumbled the earl indistinctly, his mouth full of food. How many times must I tell you not to bite off more than you can chew, snapped the undersecretary, patting the distressed earl on the back. In one ear and out the other, scolded the duke, attempting to stuff one of his words through the earl's head. If it isn't one thing, it's another, chided the minister. Out of the frying pan into the fire, shouted the count, burning himself badly. Well, you don't have to bite my head off, screamed the terrified earl, and flew at the others in a rage. The five of them scuffed wildly under the table. Stop that at once! thundered Azaz, or I'll banish the lot of you. Sorry. Excuse me. Forgive us. Pardon. Regrets, they apologized in turn, and sat down, glaring at each other. Okay, so let's go back. We started with three puns. Somersault, which means turning your head over your heels, and then salt, which is seasoning for foods. We had a rigmarole, which is a lengthy and complicated procedure, but of course he hands him a piece of bread, an actual roll, and of course cinnamon bun is a pun on cinnamon bun. And then this whole fight between the five ministers involves a bunch of idioms that are taken literally. So let's go through them. The first one, uh, your just desserts. Now notice that there are two S's in dessert. It is not one S. One S is desert. Dessert is two S's. But when you get your just desserts, it's a punishment or reward that is considered to be what the recipient deserved. It's when you get what you deserve. You're going to get your just desserts. And then to bite off more than you can chew to bite off more than you can chew means doing something that is too difficult or taking on a commitment, making a promise that you can't fulfill. You're biting off more than you can chew. And then in one ear and out the other. Well, you've probably heard that one before, right? Your parents told you something, you didn't really pay attention. It went in one ear and out the other. You were sitting in the classroom, the teacher was saying something important during a novel study, and it went in one ear and out the other. It means that you heard it, but you ignored it or you quickly forgot it because you weren't actually listening. There is a difference between hearing your ears picking up sound and actually listening, which involves the brain. And the next idiom we had was, if it isn't one thing, it's another, which just means it's everything is going wrong, bad things keep happening. If it isn't one thing, it's another. And then... And when the Earl screams, you don't have to bite my head off. Of course, when we say that, we don't mean it literally. It just means to speak to someone angrily when there's no reason. Okay, let's finish out the chapter. The rest of the meal was finished in silence until the king, wiping the gravy stains from his vest, called for dessert. Milo, who had not eaten anything, looked up eagerly. We're having a special treat today, said the king as the delicious smells of homemade pastry filled the banquet hall. By royal command, the pastry chefs have worked all night in the half bakery to make sure that... The half bakery? questioned Milo. Of course the half bakery, snapped the king. Where do you think half-baked ideas come from? Now, please don't interrupt. By royal command, the pastry chefs have worked all night to... What's a half-baked idea? asked Milo again. Will you be quiet? growled Azaz angrily. But before he could begin again, three large serving carts were wheeled into the hall, and everyone jumped up to help himself. 
They're very tasty, explained the humbug, but they don't always agree with you. Here's one that's very good. He handed it to Milo, and through the icing and nuts, Milo saw that it said, The earth is flat. People swallowed that one for years, commented the spelling bee. But it's not very popular these days, B-A-Y-S. Now let's take a pause there. A half-baked idea is an idiom. It's any idea that is not fully planned out, not carefully considered, ill-conceived, unsound, or badly thought out. And it's a foolish idea. It's, a, and it's an idea that has no common sense to it. And the earth is flat is just about one of the most popular half-baked ideas out there. I'd like you to go back up to where the humbug says uh, they're very tasty, but they don't always agree with you. Meaning that these are half-baked ideas, ideas that make no sense. But when something doesn't agree with you, when you eat it, it means that it gives you an upset stomach. And then the spelling bee says when uh, Milo reads the earth is flat, the spelling bee says people swallowed that one for years. When you swallow something, it means you believe a lie or a mistruth. Let's see what the other half-baked ideas are. People swallowed that one for years, commented the spelling bee. But it's not very popular these days, B-A-Y-S. He picked up a long one that stated, The moon is made of green cheese, and hungrily bit off the part that said cheese. Now there's a half-baked idea. Milo looked at the great assortment of cakes, which were being eaten almost as quickly as anyone could read them. The Count was munching contentedly on It Never Rains But It Pours, and the King was busy slicing one that stated Night Air Is Bad Air. And I like that one because that is a half-baked idea. Why would the air be worse at night? It's the same air as during the day. I wouldn't eat too many of those if I were you, advised Tok. They may look good, but you can get terribly sick of them. And don't you get sick of ideas that don't make sense? Don't you get sick of half-baked ideas? Don't worry, Milo replied. I'll just wrap one up for later. And he folded his napkin around. Everything happens for the best. Now, that's actually kind of funny, because... Everything happens for the best is a half-baked idea? Hmm. I mean, I kind of believe that everything happens for the best. What about you? I don't think it's a half-baked idea, but the author is making a joke that believing that everything happens for the best is a half-baked idea. But I personally don't agree. What do you think? Okay, that's it for chapter 7. I'll see you for chapter 8, which is the end of Act 1.